and the new constitution was promulgated by General Ayub Khan in 1962. There was a constitutional democracy till March 1969, when the country plunged into yet another constitutional and political crisis, leading to the second martial law in the history of Pakistan. The political turbulence and war with India led to separation of East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. The chief martial law administrator was forced to hand over power to political to the political party, which commanded majority in the western wing of the country. The issue of legality of martial law once again came under consideration before the Supreme Court of Pakistan. In Asma Jilani's case, the Supreme Court declared the martial law to be illegal. And in fact, the court dubbed the martial law administrator as the usurper. It revisited its earlier judgment and said, and I quote, that that no valid law comes from the foul mouth or smeared pen of a person guilty of treason against the national order." Unquote. In 1973, the third constitution was promulgated. In 1977, general elections were held and there were serious allegations of rigging on account of which there were countrywide country agitation and again the army took over. The takeover of the army was once again challenged before this Supreme Court in Begin Nusrat Bhutto's case. The Supreme Court justified the imposition of martial law and the army takeover on the ground of state necessity, basing its argument on the principle of Celis Papula Suprema Lex. From 1988 to 1999, the country was being ruled by a democratically elected government. In October 1999, the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, but they later reacted and took over the reins of the government, suspended the constitution and dissolved the National Assembly. He also arrested the Prime Minister of Pakistan on the allegation that he wanted to hijack the plane in which the Chief of Army staff was coming back from abroad so that the new Army Chief would assume the charge. This imposition of martial law was again challenged before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court gave it a conditional validation. The Supreme Court declared that a situation arose for which the constitution provided no solution and the army armed forces had to intervene to save the state from further chaos for maintenance of peace and order, economic stability, justice and good governance, and to safeguard integrity and sovereignty of the country dictated by highest consideration of the state necessity and welfare of the people." Unquote. Interestingly, the court also empowered the uh, president of Pakistan to amend the constitution for a limited period till normalcy was restored. This constitutional deviation came to, came to an end in 2002, where fresh elections were held. But the amendments made by the chief of army staff were validated 
through the 17th Amendment passed by the Parliament. In October 2007, when the term of the office of the then president, that is General Musharraf, was about to expire, he wanted to contest for the second term while retaining the office of the Chief Martial Law, while retaining the office of the Chief of Armed Staff. His eligibility to do so was challenged by one of the candidates. He wanted the army, the, the, he wanted the Chief Justice to assure him that he'll be allowed to contest. When the Chief Justice told him that the case of his eligibility to contest was before a different bench and the judges were independent, this was not taken well by him. On 9th of March 2007, he asked the Chief Justice to resign as according to him, he had received complaints of misconduct against him. On his refusal, General Musharraf suspended the Chief Justice and sent a reference to the Supreme Court, to, to the Supreme Judicial Council for misconduct against the Chief Justice. This sparked off a countrywide protest against the General and in favor of the Chief Justice led by the bar associations. The Chief Justice challenged the reference filed by General Musharraf against him and a 13 member bench of which I was also a member was constituted to hear the petition. The deposed Chief Justice was to address the Islamabad Bar Association two days before the final hearing of the reference against him. However, a few minutes before he reached the bar, there was a bomb blast in the bar room in which quite a few lawyers got killed and several injured. The atmosphere in the capital city, Islamabad, was tense. Late night, a judge of this, the, the judge who was heading the bench seized of the petition filed by the deposed Chief Justice came to us and said that the situation was tense and that how about adjourning the case for a few days? I said, absolutely not. Let them blast the court and we'll announce the judgment on the street in the Constitution Avenue. On two days later, we allowed the petition and reinstated the Chief Justice. This judgment not only hurt General Zigo, but aggravated his fears as also his sense of insecurity. In the meanwhile, the case of his eligibility came up before the court. I was again member of uh, uh, this 11 member bench. When the polling day approached nearer, petitioner prayed that the election should be stayed till the decision, final decision. The court, instead of staying the elections, allowed General Musharraf to contest with the condition that the election commission of Pakistan shall not notify the result till the final disposal of the petition. This conditional order raised General Musharraf's apprehension that he would not get a favorable verdict from the Supreme Court. In November, in the first week of November, the president of the Supreme Court Bar Association filed a petition before the Supreme Court that According to his information, General Musharraf is about to declare state of emergency and su suspend the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice, along with 
six judges passed an order restraining General Musharraf not to pass any order which may have the effect of suspending the constitution or changing the composition of the court. Notwithstanding the order passed by the Supreme Court, General Musharraf imposed state of emergency, directed that the constitution shall remain in abeyance, issued a provisional constitutional order prescribing a special oath for judges of the Supreme Court and High Court with the stipulation that those who did not take oath would cease to hold their offices. Out of 18 judges of the Supreme Court, 13 decided, including myself, not to take fresh oath. And out of 93 judges of four high courts, 61 refused to take fresh oath. All these judges, including the Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhary, were notified to have ceased to be judges. And most of them were put, put under house arrest. The newly appointed Chief Justice and six other judges set aside the seven ben member bench order and validated the provisional constitutional order issued by General Musharraf. There was a countrywide protest by lawyers and civil society, civil society against the action taken by General Musharraf and they demanded restoration of democracy. Even the American Bar Association for the first time came on the streets in support of the judges who had refused to take fresh oath of loyalty to General Musharraf and called for their reinstatement. It also gave its 2008 Rule of Law Award to the judges and lawyers of Pakistan for their courage in defending the Constitution. On behalf of the Pakistani judges, I was invited to their annual luncheon in New York to see, receive the award. After the general elections in February 2008, the constitution was restored and an elected government came into power. General Musharraf resigned and there was a growing demand for restoration of the judges who had been removed by General Musharraf. In September 2008 and in March 2009, all the judges, including the Chief Justice, they were stored. The, the Supreme Court of Pakistan has passed several judgments In, uh, which ref reflects its independence and its courage against impunity, uh, political impunity. Religion in public affairs has many a times led to societal conflicts. Religious extremism generates pressures and, and an atmosphere of fear. There are pressures on justice system then that cannot be attributed to politicians. Perhaps the biggest threat of judicial independence comes from religious orthodoxy. The courts, while hearing these cases, are nearly always besieged by mobs who threaten judges and lawyers both. In such a socio-political milieu, Courts have to play a more proactive role in the enforcement of human rights and the rule of law. It was this perception and belief which persuaded me as Chief Justice of Pakistan to take so much notice of some of these incidents. There was a church blast in 1981. 
during which 81 Christians died. And months passed, but no effective relief was provided to the families of those who suffered. The court, after hearing the state functionary and members of minority communities in Pakistan, gave a detailed judgment authored by me. And issued eight directions which included that the state shall provide protection to religious communities and their places of worship while interpreting article 20 of the constitution the court held that the right to religious religious freedom is for available to all, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. Notwithstanding the periodical periods of deviation from the constitution or its suspension, the judiciary enjoys a pivotal position and its Independence is ensured through various provisions of the Constitution. In view of the past experience of abrogation of the Constitution, the Constitution was amended and if Article 66, the Article 1 was added to the effect that any person who abrogates or subverts or suspends the constitution shall be guilty of high, high treason. The pol political executive and all in all political systems is very possessive of its powers. Despite the constitutional command of separating judiciary from the executive, it was not done, which persuaded the Karachi High Court Bar Association to file a petition before the Karachi High Court, seeking a direction for separation of judiciary from the executive. The petition was allowed, and this judgment was upheld by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of Pakistan, besides being the last court of appeal, both under the civil and criminal law had the power to pass an appropriate order on any question of public importance with reference to the enforcement of fundamental rights. To further buttress the authority and independence of the Supreme Court, the Constitution provides that the law or principle of law declared by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts and all executive authorities. The judges of the Supreme Court and High Court are appointed on recommendation of the Judicial Commission headed by the Chief Justice of Pakistan. Sorry for the interruption, Justice Jilani, but you may have two minutes. Uh, yes, I'm going, I'm conscious of that. Yeah. Uh, the challenges faced by judiciary in Pakistan during the last few years have recharged it and it has emerged as an active pillar of the state. It marked the beginning of a new constitutional jurisprudence. It has led to an end to constitutional deviations. The court has conceptualized the, the values with a view to enhance democracy and prevent the opposite trend. The court has passed through testing times, but those have culminated in institutional vindication. The assertion of judicial independence, the rise of a vibrant bar and a vigilant civil society 
and the emergence of an independent media would go a long way in strengthening democracy, political institutions, and in ensuring an expanded enforcement of the rule of law. The idealism reflected and the sacrifices made during the movement launched for judicial independence are a testimony to people's faith in the constitution and its abiding values. As long as this spirit is alive, the constitution and law shall reign supreme. For as Leonard Hand said, and I quote, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies, no constitution, no law, and no court can save it, unquote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin Jidani, for such a thought-provoking talk. Uh, now, uh, before inviting the second speaker, let me introduce her. Judge, Judge, Nick, Judge Kem Dilem Zaku was appointed to the course of Anambra State, Nigeria in 1998. She later was appointed to the High Court of Nigeria, where she served until 2003. From 2004 to 2006, she served as a judge on the High Court and the Court of Appeal of Gambia. In 2006, she was appointed to the High Court of Solomon Islands. She was the first female judge on the course of the Solomon Islands. In 2009, she was appointed as a judge of the United Nations Dispute Tribunal. At the United Nations Dispute Tribunal, she was based in Nairobi, Kenya. Later, she became the president of the same tribunal. I invite you to share your thoughts on the topic, fear, uh, during decision making. Over to you, please. You are mute. You are uh, uh, currently mute. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, good morning again, and thank you for this opportunity. And let me thank Judge Justice Jelani for setting the tone for these discussions. Um, Justice Jelani has, well, gone on to describe um, or define what a democracy is. And um, I imagine that in this um, forum, there's no need to talk, you know, to look at what the judiciary does. We all pretty well know what the judiciary is about. It resolves ju uh, disputes or adjudicates uh, disputes between contending parties. Um, when we talk about judicial independence, again, I guess we pretty much know what this means, that courts and judges can perform their duties free from the influence and control of others. And um, very quickly, I'd like to say that the principle of judicial independence has two aspects. First is the personal independence of a judge. Uh, which means that a judge must be able to decide a matter without interference and free from pressures and inducements and threats. And then there's the institutional independence. The judiciary itself must have, must be free from interference in decision-making by as a separate and distinct arm of government from the executive and the legislature. And I quickly want to add that judicial independence is not necessarily for the benefit of the judge. The goal of judicial independence is the fair and impartial adjudication of disputes after properly evaluating the facts and applying the law. And again, it is not for the judge to decide cases as he or she wishes or according to her or to his or her own personal interests or prejudice. Rather, a judge must be accountable for his decisions or for her decisions. Yeah, the basic, UN basic principles on independence of the judiciary states, section one of it states that the independence of the judiciary shall be guaranteed by the state and enshrined in the constitution or law of the country. And um, I'm speaking mainly talking about uh, developing judiciaries or developing democracies. I will draw a lot of examples, mainly from my own country, Nigeria, 
where I have practiced and sat on the bench. And of course, I'll also draw a few examples from the Gambia. And um, I'd like to say that many countries, including Nigeria, provide for judicial independence in their constitutions. Now, I, I chose to speak on the elements of fear and favor in judicial decision-making. And I, it's, um, you know, this is a phrase I of, I've often thought about as a judge, because usually the decision, uh, judicial oath, you know, in taking your judicial oath, these are some of the words you utter. And um, later, when you come to act, you begin to see that fear and favor is, um, is really, really a big element in judicial decision making. A judge's independence may come under attack from several sources, and the attacks may come from highly placed officials in government, from politicians, political parties, from powerful individuals in business, powerful corporate bodies, senior lawyers even, and even senior judges and heads of court. And the pressures and threats can place a judge in fear of losing his or her life. Can also place the judge in fear of losing his or her job, fear of offending persons who can blackmail them or set them up or retaliate through denial of deserved promotion at work and denial of due opportunities for training and career enhancement in the workplace. Some influential persons may be in position even to find spurious reasons and make spurious allegations um, to, in order to terminate the services of a judge. On the other hand, an unscrupulous judge might be open to favors and inducement in the form of money, of promotion, even Dessert, in the form of greater opportunities at work to serve on panels where extra allowances are paid and visibility assured, expensive gifts are given, expensive holidays, and even employment for family members. And some judges willingly diminish judicial independence because they make it a habit to hobnob with politicians and women and to seek their patronage. Such a judge will be open to influence from these people and would also be open to helping them influence other judges, thereby destroying judicial independence. And very quickly, I just like to, you know, give examples of um, where um, occasions when judicial independence has been attacked has been under attack and uh, where the elements of fear and favor have been real issues. I'll start with, for instance, the example of uh, what Justice, the late Justice Basik Beme in Nigeria. After about 23 years of punishing military rule, Nigerians were promised a return to democratic rule by the then general Babangida government in 1993. The military went ahead to promulgate the transition to civil rule decree, and in its section 37, specifically ousted the jurisdiction of courts regarding the conduct of the elections, which kind of made Nigerians um, uh, uh, um, happy or confident that this time around the elections will take place and there will be a return to civil rule. But despite that, Late at night and barely <clears throat> a day before the election was to take place, Justice Ikpeme, the late Justice Bas Ikpeme of the High Court was appointed, appointed judge just a few months before, granted an ex parte injunction based on the application of a shadowy group that called itself the Association, of, uh, the Association for Better Nigeria. The injunction granted by the judge restrained the country's electoral commission from conducting the presidential election. The election was nevertheless conducted as scheduled on 12 June 1993. 
and most of the real is all that last. But then on 16 June, four days after the uh, conduct of election and announcement of results, another High Court judge, Dahiru Salim, who was just Judge Justice Ikpeme's head of court, that is the Federal uh, High Court, or you know the federal, so not the Federal High Court, the the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja, um, Justice Saleh, who was Chief Judge of the of the Federal Capital Territory High Court, ordered the electoral body to stop announcing the results of the election, and five days later. On 21st June, the same Justice Saleh avoided the presidential election, saying it was illegal, following the midnight ex parte order of Justice Ikpeme. These actions by the two judges were the reasons given by the military rulers to annul the election and to continue in office, throwing the country into untold turmoil and darkness for years to come. Justice Ikpeme was, before her sudden appointment to the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory, employed as a lawyer in the private law firm of the then attorney general of the country. It is widely believed that she was merely appointed for the purpose of using her to do this hatchet job. Now, very quickly, I will talk about a few personal experiences. I was a judge in the High Court of Anambra State between two, uh, in, uh, in the High Court of Anambra State. And then between 2001 and 2003, I came across uh, uh, these uh, 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 very real issues of fear and favor. I had had an ex parte motion and granted interim orders in a, in a matter. I also ordered that the respondent be put on notice so that I could hear both parties on the same application within 14 days. But a few days before the hearing on notice, the highest ranking officer in the State's Ministry of Justice visited me at home. She told me the state governor was interested in the case and wanted me to vacate the interim orders I had made. She told me I would be given whatever I wanted. She actually asked me to name my price. <laughs> if only I would do what the governor wanted and vacate my, uh, my orders. Well, when I later on gave a contrary decision based on the facts and the law, I came under fire. Several threats were made to my life. I can't go into the details now. I was also transferred to a duty station without electricity in the courtroom and chambers. And there was no water or even decent furniture in my chambers. Often I had to buy candles to place on my table in the courtroom to enable me record proceedings. That's how dark the courtroom could get. There were also efforts to take me through a disciplinary process. Work was made very difficult for me and subtle hints were being dropped about me being corrupt and that kind of thing. This situation continued for about two years, including threats to my life until I had to, I, I fled the country to the UK on a hastily arranged leave of absence. Of course, I reported to the judicial authorities and so on. And um, so this was my story. Well, later I was recruited by the Commonwealth and much later by the UN. And while working as a judge of the Commonwealth, recruited by the Commonwealth in the Gambia in 2004, 2006, in December, 2005, I gave a minority judgment in the Gambia Court of Appeal in a matter in which the then president of the country, Ajame, was interested because his political opponents were the defendants. I knew that my minority judgment allowing an appeal filed by the president's political opponents would threaten my job. This was especially risky so soon after the president had openly condemned and called the judiciary on complimentary names um, following the discharge of the leader of a rival political party who had contested for the presidency from a case of murder. Retaliation was swift. The approval already given by the Gambian government to the Commonwealth for renewal of my two-year contract was immediately withdrawn. And within two months, I found myself without a job. 
Another case, Nigerian case, I don't know if I have time. Another Nigerian case I wish to highlight is that of the of the Honorable Justice Salami, who was president of the Court of Appeal in Nigeria between 2009 and 2011. He was removed without due process by the National Judicial Council, headed by the Chief Justice of the country. When he disclosed that the then Chief Justice tried to influence the decision of the Court of Appeal, this court, in an election matter in order to favor the ruling party. He was widely criticized by members of the ruling party. A new Chief Justice later recommended recommended his reinstatement, but the same government was still in power and refused, and they refused to um, reinstate him. Interestingly, six years later, that government was no longer in power. The NJC appointed the same judge, the National Judicial Council, appointed the same judge. The National Judici the Judicial Council that had earlier recommended his removal, I guess composed of different people now, um, they now uh, uh, appointed him head of monitoring corruption cases throughout the country. And uh, very quickly, I'd like to touch on another instance in which a head of court in my country fell out with a seven woman magistrate. Unfortunately, the woman magistrate later became involved in a matter for which she was charged to court. The head of court instructed a male magistrate to whom he had assigned the matter to not grant bail to the woman magistrate, even though the alleged offense was bailable. The presiding magistrate, in order not to offend the head of court, his head of court, refused the woman magistrate bail. She was even denied the request to collect her blood pressure medication and other medication that she needed to take daily. Instead, she was promptly driven to the awaiting trial cell at the prisons where she was booed and jeered at by other prisoners. The woman magistrate wept bitterly and was found dead in the cell the next morning. There are many instances also where senior judges and heads of court try to influence the decision of their junior colleagues in pending cases. So when we talk about judicial independence and interference, it's not just about interference, from government, from business people, and so on. Sometimes there's an interference from superiors, from your head of court, and so on, for whatever reason, or who whoever interest they might be serving, there can be interference, internal interference. It might be difficult to lose their lives or lose their jobs or other things precious to them because the judge has given a decision based on pressures based on threats, based on fear, based on inducement, or because the judge expects some kind of fear and they allow themselves to be interfered with. We will not be able to estimate how many people have been so badly affected and how many others have lost their lives. Now, very quickly, I'd like to look at how judicial independence can be strengthened to minimize the elements of fear and favor in given judicial decisions. I mean, the examples I have given, of course, are far from exhaustive because there are so many, 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 many other cases where as a judge, you come under threat, you come under fear, you are placed in fear and, and inducements are offered to you in order to for you to give your ruling or your judgment in the way that, well, people, well, uh, powerful people will prefer. And I want to say that any uh, honest efforts at strengthening judicial independence must be holistic. I'm talking about my country, Nigeria now, and I guess this will also apply to other demo uh, developing democracies. It requires commitment on the part of individual judges. It also requires institutional commitment and accountability. The executive and legislative arms of government must also be committed to achieving a reliable judiciary. And on the part of individual judges, <clears throat> I'd like to say the personal character of the judge is very important. I mean, we had Justice Gilani and uh, the number of times he stood firm and um, upheld 
uh, judicial independence. Well, not every judge is like that. And um, because the judge must have integrity, the judge must be courageous, the judge must be impartial, the judge must be principled and professional and sufficiently committed to asserting his or her independence. And then I'd like to say also that a good law school education and qualification is priceless. Adequate training on judicial ethics is very important. A judge must avoid questionable socialization and friendships with politicians and other, you know, certain other kinds of members of society who will be interested in not just influencing them, but in even getting them to influence fellow judges. Because many times it is another judge that is used to get to you as a judge. On the part of the judiciary as an institution, the judiciary has to take the doctrine of separation of powers very seriously. It must en endeavor to limit contact with the executive branch of government. Only to such issues such uh, as security and financial matters and maybe administrative matters. The judiciary must also limit contact with legislators and political parties. Again, the process for appointment of judges must be fair. It was Mar uh, Warren Buffett who points out that the most quali uh, important quality in selecting a person for a job is integrity. The nature of a judge's work demands that selection of judges must be based first on personal integrity, ability, proper qualification, training, non-discrimination. The kind of judicial appointments which are sometimes based on lobbying by influential persons in government and business must cease. The salary of judges must be fixed and secure. Judges must also have security of tenure. A judge should only be suspended or removed for reasons of incapacity or misconduct. And the mode of assignment of cases should be properly established to avoid forum shopping and the assignment of cases to judges who, can, who are pliable and can be influenced. I think a judge from Ghana had once mentioned that in Ghana there's um, a method for assignment of cases, you know, rather than a head of court or something simply assigning whatever they wanted to whoever they wanted. The judiciary must see to it that courtrooms are open to members of the public to come and observe trials. The courts must make their decisions accessible and the media must be allowed in court. Of course, with proper guidelines as to their reporting to ensure fair, tri fair trials. And I also like to advocate that should, there should be tenure for heads of court. And finally, on the part of government, the executive arm of government, of course, controls the powers, controls everything. And um, in Nigeria, financial autonomy for the judiciary is a thorny issue. As after several strike actions by judiciary staff and so on, after the year, institutions financial for the institutions financial autonomy to be respected, judiciary is still severely underfunded and goes cap in hand to government for funds to finance the courts. The lack of respect by government for orders made by the courts is a direct attack on the rule of law and therefore on judicial independence. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that the judgeship is a calling. Those who will be judges cannot expect that this noble calling will make them rich or ensure a bulging bank balance. Far from it. In present day Nigeria, public institutions have been bitten by the bug of corruption. Whether it's in politics, or among elected officials, the civil service, medical services, education, security forces, or even religion. Corruption has eaten deep into the nation's fabric. Our judiciary is not different, but with enough judicial will, it can become as it ought to be, the last hope of the common man. I don't know if I still have time. Sorry for the question. Yes, I think we're out of time, but we can conclude it. Oops. I didn't hear that, sorry. Uh, we have two minutes to conclude. Okay. So I think um, like I, 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 I've, I've just said, the judgeship is a calling and anyone who thinks they become a judge and um, they hope 
to be rich, like some business people, or they want to wield power, like um, the kind of political power, like politicians, will be making a huge mistake. It's a noble calling. It's, um, I mean, the judgeship is about morality. And there's no other way about it. So for those who want to be judges, um, they have to be careful to evaluate whether it is indeed what they want to do. I'd also want to say that part of the problem in appointment of judges, some in developing democracies sometimes, is it's about who is recommending or who is nominating or at whose instance is a judge being appointed. Sometimes it's at the instance of the governor. He holds the purse, like in state judiciaries in this country. He holds the purse and he can, you know, make it a condition that you will include people he wants, even if they are not, you don't think, you know, the heads of court or top judicial officers don't see them as suitable. The governor can insist that you include people he wants before he will approve any appointment of judges. Um, in the same way, the, some businessmen are so powerful and they have the power of the purse and can sometimes buy their way in to have uh, 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 some kinds of people appointed judges. These, um, I think, um, this is how I'd like to conclude that every all hands have to be on deck. And in, in spite of the fact, although the country has its um, challenges with uh, corruption, I do not see why judicial officers who are specially placed because they are expected to have integrity be above board at all times, I think the judiciary should be a good starting point. In fact, for even the uh, turnaround that we need in de developing democracies. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the first question for you, Justice Jilani, is that if is from one Philip Mandangi, and he or she is asking that if separation of power is one of the principles of democracy, how do you justify the appointment of judiciary members by the politicians? Uh, you are muted. You are muted. Yeah, no, please go ahead. Uh, well, in fact, uh, many democratic countries have uh, uh, different modes of appointment of judges. And uh, the countries where uh, parliament are politicians have greater say. This mode of appointing judges uh, has come under a lot of criticism. US is a classic example of such a, such a system where, particularly in the Supreme Court, the judges are appointees of a political party in power. And um, uh, in the famous uh, Al Gore versus Bush, the integrity of the court uh, came under discussion. And uh, one of the dissenting judges said that uh, uh, the very integrity of the court uh, has been compromised. Anyway, so I agree with the questioner that uh, political interference in the appointment of judges uh, uh, compromises judicial independence. There has to be a balance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Then there are two questions. I think that's, uh, those two questions are related to Justice uh, and Dillon, to your presentation. And that is, I think the question is from a person who put his name in a Greek 
language and I can't, I mean, can't pronounce it because it's truly. So I, I will just read out the question. Uh, and that question is, should a judge be out of social life in order to maintain judicial independence by reassuring no influence will be imposed by external stakeholders? Similar to this question, there's another question which is quite similar to this, and that is by Azim Amedi. Uh, how is the role of the uh, Honorable Honorary Consul, simil similar ethics body in your country's respective courts, in upholding the ethics to avoid the judges from being influenced to act against the code of ethics and the rule of law? This question is addressed to me. Yeah. yeah so the, the, the second question is generally open to all, but the first question was for Justice Kemdelum. Fine. Yeah, yeah, thank so you. Okay. Um, the question is, should a judge be out of social life yeah. in order to maintain judicial independence? Yes. To a large extent. Um, the judge is not expected to be a socialite. Um, the judge must, exp you know, uh, uh, nobody is saying the judge cannot socialize, but the judge needs to be careful about who they socialize with. You are not expected to be seen uh, uh, hobnobbing with politicians, um, politically exposed persons, you know, you're not expected to be there are some, some companies that you don't, you know, you don't want to be seen in. You are not um, a party crawler or a socialite. And that's the truth. You will socialize, but you have to be careful to, you have to look around you. And I'll tell you the, the truth. Even here, you know, like our, and let me say specifically in Nigeria, we have cultures, you know, um, where we relate, for instance, we have extended family structures, extended family, you know, and so on, which is not the same in some Western countries. And um, because of the kind of social structures we have, we have a very big uh, uh, events like um, marriage, ceremonies and um, funeral ceremonies and so on where members of the public everybody you don't they don't need an invitation to attend at, at least in nigeria and at least in my culture people don't need an invitation to come to a funeral you know and um you know this will give opportunity for people who know that this funeral is in your family to, to try to get closer to you than they ought to you know some of these people are litigants some of them have matters pending before you. And some of them are just habitual litigants anyway. And they want to know, uh, sorry, they want to show or make people believe that they are close to you. This is not a situation that a judge should allow. So I'm not saying a judge shouldn't socialize, but the judge should be careful about his socialization. And of course, avoid certain classes of people. Wealthy, rich, people, businessmen, and so on. They love to come close. I mean, um, I'm talking about the societies I know. They love to come close to judges, you know, because usually, like I said, they are always potential litigants, habitual litigants, and uh, they want to show that they, uh, uh, they have some kind of a um, relationship or friendship, which should not be condoned. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. That code provides that, uh, number one, judges should not socialize. Number two, that uh, uh, they should not, uh, uh, while hearing a case, give the impression of being too close to uh, a, a lawyer who is arguing the case before the judge and uh, uh, they should not hear a case which uh, directly or indirectly 
is related to uh, their friend or a relative and then so on and so forth. Um, so we have a code of conduct and the judges are expected to abide by that. In fact, uh, my perception is that even a retired judge is bound by the code of conduct because uh, he continues to enjoy the privileges of a retired judge, a handsome pension, security. So um, the state and the institution expect that he should abide by the code of conduct. Thank you very much. The next question is for Justice Hendelin Zaku, and the question is, should the judges be made to declare their interest as is the case for politicians? Sorry, what is the, sorry, what, what is the question again? Should the judges be made to declare their interests as it is the case for politicians? Declare their interest? Yeah. You mean assets? I mean, kind of. I, I think he is referring to assets, yeah. Uh, interest. Oh, okay, assets. okay, okay. Okay, yes, yes. Of course, it's a, in Nigeria, it's a requirement. You have to declare your assets. Yes, in Nigeria, you, and I, I, I believe it's a yearly declaration or periodic declaration of assets. Yes, we do that. And yeah, you, a judge has to declare their assets. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is for you, Justice Jilani. And the question is from uh, Abdul Rahim, uh, Muhammad Abdul Rahim. And the question is, does the colonial legacy affect judicial independence in South Asian countries? Of course, you might not be able to talk for all South Asian countries, but what about Pakistan? You're muted. Can yeah. you repeat the question? Yeah, the question, the question is, does the colonial legacy affect judicial independence in South Asian countries? Colonial legacy? Well, uh, uh, colonial legacy, I don't think so. Uh, colonial legacy should not... Uh, affect your judicial independence um, because uh, colonial legacy is a very general term and uh, it includes many things but uh, with reference to judiciary I don't think there is anything which uh, um, with anything in the legacy which uh, compromised with judicial independence because uh, post-independence countries have their own respective constitutions and in their respective constitutions judicial independence has been particularly provided they have a code of conduct and they are supposed to abide by that and there is supreme judicial council which uh, you know which hear the cases of judicial misconduct so I, I, I say no Legacy doesn't affect judicial independence. And, um...